The rest of today in this room, until we get to the open talks, are going to be what I like to call surveys. Um, if you were to come into this event with no knowledge of how to build robots, how to connect electrons to one point to the other, how to make things move and light. The goal of these workshops, uh, or surveys, is to give you the language to then ask further questions. Think of it as when you, uh, either you've done to or done yourself, hey, where would I find out information about X? And somebody or yourself says it to the other person, or gee, this gets awkward now. Um, let me Google that for you, right? Well, it's hard to know the words that you need to use to find the information that you want. These surveys are intended to do that. So think of these as a good vernacular grab um, to get you the words that you may need. And by no means do you have to be experts of the words afterwards. There's no actual test. You don't have a test, do you? There's no test after this one. I don't know about the rest. Um, and so the first one that we're going to start out with is a foundational. Think of it as a core building block. Um, it is Electronic Fundamentals by Brian Hughes. So uh, I'm a front-end JavaScript dev at RDO. Uh, in a previous life, I actually got a PhD in electrical engineering. So I'm going to channel my inner grad student today and um, teach you about some circuits, about the very basics. So first, we need to know what is electricity? What is voltage and current? You know, this is the fundamental physical nature of all of our circuits. Uh, basically, what we have is whenever we have two pieces in a circuit, this could be you know, either end of a battery, this could be either side of a capacitor, a type of component, you know, any sort of electrical thing where we have a difference in electrons. We have one side that has an excess of electrons, and we have another side that has uh, you know, a dearth of electrons. And we have this differential. This is where we have voltage. This is this you know, difference in electrons. Uh, of course, like anything in nature, uh, electricity, electricity likes to be in balance. So those electrons will want to flow from where there's too many to where there's not enough and equal out. And when we have this flow of electrons, we call this current. And you know, this is something that we can measure, both voltage and current. Voltage is potential, current is the actual flow. And whenever we build a circuit, we're constructing all these different components in a way that alters the flow to do what we want. And there's a lot of different components we can use. Here's a few of the fundamental ones, and this is also the symbols that we use. We use these symbols uh, whenever we draw out our circuits. So you, know, you see this little squiggly line in a circuit? That means it's a resistor. And a resistor is a, de a device that simply impedes the flow of electricity. It kind of you know, it slows it down at a very specific rate. But we also have a capacitor. And what this does is it likes to allow current to flow through it if it's changing, you know, if you have some sort of changing signal, you know, a sine wave or something like that. If it's not changing, then the capacitor likes to block it. And then we have an inductor, which is the exact opposite of a capacitor. It likes to let through electricity that's not changing but inhibit you know, signals that are changing. Of course, we have batteries. We all know what those are, but this is the symbol for a battery. Then there's a device called a diode. And a diode is a device that only allows current to flow in one direction. So you know, it will flow through one direction really easily, and it won't flow at all in the other. And diodes have all kinds of uses. The most common type of diode, at least that we are going to use here, is called a light-emitting diode, or LED. And this is a device that simply lights up. You know, we use these all the time to indicate all sorts of things. In fact, this will probably be the first circuit you built. You know, getting a LED to light up is the hello world of hardware. Uh, and then just some other symbols you'll see is uh, VCC and ground. VCC is it's kind of like a little placeholder. This means this is connected to the battery without having to draw a line over to the battery in your schematic. And you end up with this whole mess because there's all these lines going to your battery and you can't read it. And then ground is you know, just like VCC, except it connects to the negative side of the battery. But once again, it's just a placeholder. All right, so let's get on to what we actually do with this stuff. So there is math ahead. Yeah, I wish I could have borrowed this slide from that first talk. You know, there will be math, very basic stuff. So we can start off with a very, very, very simple circuit in which we connect a battery and a resistor. When we do this, there are very carefully you know, controlled states in this. So there's a very, very simple formula that tells us all of the values in this. And this formula is called Ohm's law. And it simply says that the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. The voltage is measured in volts. 
current, which is specified by an I because reasons. Uh, that's measured in amps. And then we have uh, R, which is resistance, and that is measured in ohms. And a good way of thinking of how these work together is that, you know, once again, voltage is the potential. You can think of it as trying to, it's what's trying to push this current along. But then, you know, ohms are restraining it, you know, kind of like we have in this fun little picture. I think those characters are peanuts, but I'm not exactly sure. There's another formula we can use to calculate, similar to Ohm's law, and that's we can calculate the power going through this circuit. And we all know about power. You buy a 100-watt light bulb. It's called 100 watts because it's using 100 watts of power. And so we calculate that simply by multiplying the voltage times the current, which is also the voltage squared over the resistance. Now, one thing that is important to note from this formula, what this tells us, is that as the voltage increases, the power increases exponentially. So you know, we like low-voltage things for low power. But then if we ever have a high power thing, it likes high voltage. And so sometimes you know, we can get into some interesting issues with that. But of course, we can do more than just one resistor. We could, say, put two resistors. If we put them uh, kind of linked like this in a line, we call this putting them in series. And there's a very simple formula to control that as well. It's just the voltage times the resistor uh, of the, what we want divided by the sum of the two. And this will give us the voltage across one resistor. So if we have two resistors that are the exact same value, let's say we use uh, one kilo ohm resistors, and we have a five volt battery, then that means we'll have a 2.5 volt drop across the first resistor and a 2.5 volt drop across the second one. You can take a multimeter and put it across either side of that one resistor, and you'll see 2.5. But then we can also put the uh, resistors in parallel, as we call it, which is basically putting them side by side. In this case, the voltage is the same across those two resistors. You know, if we have a five volt battery again, that's five volts across each one. But the current changes in this case. The current actually splits between the two sides. And once again, here's the formula to control that. Now, there's some interesting things to note about both of these two cases. Uh, you know, we don't often put two resistors that are close to each other. Where this comes out more often is we have some device with some inherent resistance in it that we want to use. And everything has resistance. But we don't like what that resistance is. We want it to be something else. So let's say you, know, you have a motor or an LED or something like that. Uh, we can use these formulas to basically say, OK, well, this thing has a super high resistance. But we can see, in this case, if we have a super high resistance times something that's basically 0, well, that's how you can kind of like cancel it out. Moving on to LEDs. So these work a little bit differently. Um, an LED actually has a fixed voltage drop across it. Uh, they always drop by about 1.3 volts. I know some are a little more, some are a little less. You have to go to the data sheets, but it's pretty much always 1.3. And so that doesn't matter if you put it connected to a 1.3 volt battery or to a 100 volt battery. It's always going to be 1.3. So what about the rest of the voltage? You know, where does that go? Well, if you hook that 100 volt battery up to 1.3 volts, that means the rest of that voltage has to drop on the wire, and a wire is uh, wires have resistance, but it's super, super tiny. It's like maybe 0.1 ohms. So if we go back to the formula, that basically means we get infinite current. And this is bad. That's when things start to smoke and catch on fire and blow up. So you always put a resistor after it to essentially soak up the rest of that voltage. And you can calculate kind of based on this formula here. You take whatever the voltage of your battery is, subtract that 1.3 volts from the LED, and divide by the current you want. And now, in this case, we actually have two variables. We don't know what the resistance is, and we don't know what the current. So we just kind of pick a current we like. If you really want to get in-depth, LEDs have a current that they really like, you know, that where they operate best at. But for the most part, you can usually just say, eh, I want about a 3 kilo ohm resistor. And you're usually good. So you can just kind of eyeball that. So those are some basic circuits. And, but these are all very analog. You know, I'm talking about you know, these are different voltage values, and it's just kind of going all over the place. So how do we do digital logic? You know, in our software world, we are you know, dealing with software. It's, you know, everything is true and false. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a binary. You know, it has no notion of this whole analog thing. So how do we take these analog values that can be anything and constrain it such that it makes sense to computers? Well, this is where we use you know, what we call digital logic. And there's a variety of different types that are, have subtle differences, but pretty much everything uses what's called CMOS logic these days. And so that's what we see on this chart. Basically what it says is anything that's about zero volts is going to be logic low you know, or false. 
and then anything that is about, you know, whatever your supply voltage is, five volts for the Arduino, for the most part we're gonna be dealing with five volts, we say that's a logic one. But voltage has a funny kind of way of not ever being exactly what you want. You know, wires basically act like tiny little antennas, so they're always picking up little bits of noise, you know, stray noise going through the air from Wi-Fi and power and stuff like that. So they kind of like to wiggle around a bit. So we can't say it has to be exactly five volts. They actually have a threshold. And so really, uh, on the, this is for the Arduino, this little waveform, anything that is below one volt, it counts as false. And anything above about 3.5 volts, it counts as true. And, but there's a little bit more on top of that as well. It, once your a value is false, you know, it can wander all the way up to about 3.2 volts and it'll say false. It's once it crosses that threshold, this sort of like true threshold, then it will switch to true. And then it can stay up there and wander all the way down to a little over one volt and it won't switch. But once it crosses that false threshold, then it will switch to false. And this is called uh, latching, if you care to know the technical term for it. But you know, so basically it's this kind of thresholding thing. As long as the voltages are roughly in that area, you get your true and you get your false. So once we have this, we want to actually do some, you know, now we know how this works, we want to do some actual digital logic stuff. So we can talk about a switch. So this is the most basic thing. You think you have your push button switch and you want to connect this to your Arduino. So whenever you push this button, you, know, you light up an LED or you turn on a motor or you know, anything like that. So a switch is, you know, it's on and off. You know, it's got a nice binary aspect to it you know, as far as the physical side. And so we connect it like this. We take one end of the switch and we'll connect it to our five volts to the power pin you know, off the Arduino. And we connect the other end of the switch to uh, a digital input pin, so, uh, you know, a pin we want to read this on. But uh, like I said, voltage has a funny way of not being digital when we really want it to. So you notice I have this little resistor. You're probably wondering what that little resistor is. So as I said, everything has resistance to it, you know, whether we want it to or not. And this includes these input pins on the resistor, or on the Arduino. But they're very, very big. They're typically measured in mega ohms, which is very, very large for resistor. And then, like I said, all these uh, wires around here, they kind of act like little antennas. So you combine these two things together, and your input pin, if it's not connected to anything, will actually wander all over the place. And sometimes it'll accidentally trigger a one, even though there's nothing connected to it. And so what we do is we can put this resistor here, and that basically controls it when it's closed or when the switch is open. So you know, the switch is you know, open, so it's not connected. And now all we have is a res resistor connected to ground going to your pin. And of course, if you remember earlier, I talked about series resistors. Uh, if you have one resistor that's in series really, really, really big, and one that's really, really, really tiny, you know, that tiny one is actually going to end up sort of dominating in this case. Uh, so you get basically a zero, or the big one dominates. So you get a zero volt drop basically across that, this resistor on the bottom, we call it a pull down resistor. And so we get zero volts on the pin and then everything else is on the inside. And so that forces it to zero, but then the switch closes. So you, you push it down and now we have VCC connected to the top of that resistor. And you know, the switch is gonna close and the wire, they all have a resistance of roughly zero, like I was saying earlier. And so you basically have a zero ohm resistor in series with a 10 kilo ohm resistor, so all the voltage is gonna be across that resistor, and now we're actually reading five volts. And so now we actually are locking it pretty closely to five volts and zero volts, whether it's open or closed. So whenever you use a switch, make sure you put a pull down resistor on it, uh, like this. So this is great if you, know, you want a human being you know, where we have thumbs and fingers to press a button. But what if you want your robot to activate a switch? You know, our Arduinos don't have fingers, and you can always build one, but that's really complicated. So instead, we can use a device called a relay. And a relay is basically just a switch, but instead of having you know, a physical button you push, it has a, a little electronic coil in it that you can actually activate from your Arduino. And here's a very basic example of how you would use it. You know, you connect, uh, there are uh, usually three or four pins, or, or, or four or five, sometimes six pins, depending on the type. This particular one has five, and what it does is, you know, we connect one end to ground. This is kind of like the control end, and we connect the other control pin to the pin we want on the Arduino. We can set this high or low. Whenever it's low, there's gonna be nothing going through this relay at all, and so that's gonna leave the switch connected to basically that bottom pin coming out, the little red pin. But then when we set our uh, pin on the Arduino high, 
that's actually going to cause this little electromagnetic coil to cause a switch to flip over and connect the high side. So, now, why would you want to do it? It seems like we're just setting a pin higher or low so that we can set another pin higher or low. You know, it seems like we're being a little redundant. Well, there's actually a lot of reasons we may want to do this. You know, I mentioned earlier that you know, some things like to be really, really low power, and microcontrollers like to be low power. But some things like a lot of power, you know, we have big motors. Motors like to be high power. And so they don't, they can't, they don't mix. You can't really mix them. You know, your Arduino runs off of 5 volts, but your motors oftentimes will be 12 volts. But you know, it's not the same voltage. And things have to be at the same voltage in order to work properly. You know, if you're expecting 12 volts on a motor and you give it 5, it's not going to work very well if it works at all. And a relay allows you to switch those voltages up. You can take 5 volts in on your control side, and then you can have 12 volts hooked up on the other side. And also, on the relay, you can dump as much power through that as you want, within usually some limits. And so this is how you get a low-power device to control a really high-power device, is by using a relay. Now, relays do have some disadvantages to them. Uh, first of all, they're these big mechanical things. You know, there is a physical piece of metal that's moving inside. And as we know, the, the real world is very, very slow. You know, our, our processors, you know, even in Arduino, is running at clock speeds of, you know, several million times a second. So taking you know, a tenth of a second for this relay to switch is an eternity. So sometimes we want something a little bit faster. And this is where transistors come into play. You know, transistors form the heart of pretty much all modern electronics. And at its very basic level, a transistor is something that takes one signal in in some format and converts it to another format coming out. There's a lot of different types of transistors, um, far more than I could cover here. And, and they do different things. But just as one example, there's one type of transistor called a field effect transistor, or FET, which is what I have uh, demonstrated here on this slide. And they basically act as a switch. And they work you know, pretty similar to a relay. They take you know, some low power signal in to what's called the gate, which is essentially you know, that control input. And then it will either connect or disconnect the other two pins. And so it can act like a switch. And so you could come up with a circuit that looks kind of like this to drive you know, your high-powered motor once again. So it's doing the same thing as a relay, except there's no mechanical moving parts. So it's really, really fast. You, know, you can switch this thing on and off you know, thousands of times, tens of thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times a second. So you know, there's much, much better performance. Of course, there are some limitations. Uh, relays are really good at isolation. And sometimes you need that. Uh, that gets a little more complicated, but sometimes you need a relay. But you know, a lot of times, transistors do the same thing. Now, fortunately, you don't have to work with transistors directly, because you know, figuring out how to design a transistor circuit is actually kind of complicated. You know, that takes some practice to figure out how to work. But fortunately, a lot of you know, circuits and other chips, you, you, they do all this stuff for us and give us some nice, easy-to-use package. So if you've ever used an Arduino and you use a motor shield on it, and uh, if you haven't, when you build your SEMO uh, bot later today, you will use one of these. Uh, they can sometimes have, uh, they have like a little board that has just like an input you know, for your pen and outputs for the motor. And at the heart of it is a series of transistors. So anytime you see this like, you know, digitals or these circuits you know, using chips that are like converting signals for you, at the heart is a transistor. And that is how it does it. And so finally, I'll talk about power. I've been you know, hinting at this the entire time. But keep in mind that everything in, in electronic circuits, you know, every single device has some sort of power limit. You know, they say you, know, you can't exceed this voltage, or you can't exceed this current. And whenever you do exceed those limits, that's when you damage your device. You know, that's when you get you know, a little bit of smoke coming out of your LED, or you get a little capacitor that you know, blows up or something. And uh, fortunately, we're only going to be dealing with uh, DC voltage today, you know, little batteries. And so if something gets damaged, it's actually not a big deal. You know, you're probably not going to get hurt doing that, uh, you know, as opposed to working with AC voltage, you know, what comes out of the wall. That can be dangerous. So that's something we're not going to deal with here, because that, that takes a lot of experience to make sure you don't hurt yourself. Um, but you know, just always keep in mind there are limits. Uh, microcontrollers themselves actually have pretty low limits. Uh, they put out a very, very low uh, power signals. The amount of current and general power coming out of a pin is very low. So it's rare that you can drive a motor with a microcontroller directly. So just something to keep in mind. Usually you have to have something in between, especially if this is a type of motor called like a DC motor, 
which is you know, the big round things that are usually about like this. So you always want to have something in between. And the key to making great hardware is making sure everything is happy power-wise. You understand that you know, certain things need high power, certain things are low power, and figuring out how to interface the two to make both of them happy is how you can make some great robots. And with that, I bid you happy hacking. <laughs>